Today is going to go rather quickly, so I apologize for the speed, but you can push pause anytime you feel like you need to. Hopefully you're keeping in mind as you go through these lessons um, how that might connect to the movie. Hopefully some of these things that you see on the right, you have down on the back side. And just keep in mind, keep connecting, keep connecting, and looking for examples and evidence. We last left off, we were talking about how um, many farmers were really struggling um, and losing money at every turn. You can see in this political cartoon um, that in addition to all the things that we already talked about, how railroad companies were becoming so big that there's also some corruption amongst the um, railroad companies as well that's also hurting farmers. Problems with railroads. Throughout the 1870s, the farmers and other debtors pushed the government to issue more money and put it into circulation, hoping to drop the value of the dollar so that they could pay back the loans that they had, the money that they had borrowed, in cheaper money instead of more expensive money like we talked about in the last lesson. Those tactics, though, failed. Although the Bland-Allison Act of 1878 required the government to buy in coin at least $2 million to $4 million worth of silver, it just wasn't enough. Meanwhile, farmers were paying outrageously high prices to transport grain. Lack of competition amongst the railroads meant that it might cost more to ship grain from the Dakotas to Minneapolis by rail than from Chicago to England by boat. Also, railroads made secret agreements with middlemen, grain brokers and merchants that allowed the railroads to control grain storage prices and influence the market price of crops. Many farmers had to mortgage their farms for credit with which to buy seed and supplies. Suppliers charged really high rates of interest, sometimes charging more for the items bought on credit than they did for cash purchases. So farmers got caught in a cycle of credit that meant longer hours, more debt every year. It was time to reform. Along comes a gentleman by the name of Oliver Hudson Kelly and in 1867 to effectively push for reforms, farmers began to organize. Oliver Hudson Kelly started something called the Patrons of Husbandry. And if you know something about FFA, you know that husbandry has to do with animal breeding. Um, so this organization was meant to deal with all sorts of things around, farmer, uh, around farming. But anyway, the Patrons of Husbandry was an organization for farmers that became really popularly known as the Grange. Its original purpose was to produce a so provide a social outlet and an educational forum for isolated farm families. But by the 1870s, the Grange members spent most of their time and energy talking about and discussing the railroad. Eventually, that became organization and fighting against the railroad. Granges are dotted throughout your community. Um, it's likely that on your ride home, you're going to pass one or maybe even two. The Grange played a big, uh, big role in your local history here. By the 1870s, Grange members spent most of their time fighting against the railroads. Their battle plan included teaching its members how to organize, how to set up farmers' cooperatives, and how to sponsor state legislations to regulate the railroad. The Grange gave rise to other organizations such as the Farmers Alliance. These groups included many others who sympathized with farmers. Alliances sent lecturers from town to town to educate people about topics such as lower interest rates on loans and the government control over railroad and banks. Spellbinding speechers, speakers such as Mary Elizabeth Lees, who is down here on the left, nice bun lady, but she was very effective, helped get the message across. Membership grew to more than four million dollars. Four million people, and thanks for the bell. Membership grew to more than four million people, mostly in the South and in the West. The Southern Alliance, including white and Southern farmers, was the largest with about 250,000 uh, people belonging to uh, offshoots like the African American Colored Farmers National Alliance, which had a separate uh, institution at the time. Some Alliance members promoted cooperation between black and white, but most members accepted the separation of the organizations at the time. Leaders of the Alliance movement realized that to make far-reaching changes, they would need to build a base of political power. And as a result, populism, a movement of the people, is going to be born. 
That's a big deal in the movie, okay? Some of the things that Mary Elizabeth Lease would talk about are interest rates, the government control of railroads, you know, not, instead of private control of the railroads, that maybe the government ought to um, step in and regulate railroads because they were becoming so important to the economic um, and social and political uh, being of Americans. And also to regulate banks, put rules upon banks. And also um, the Farmers Alliance really wanted bimetallism. They wanted money backed in both gold and silver because right now in the, the federal government was, the money was backed by gold only and it made the money very expensive. Bimetallism meant backing the money with silver and gold, which would, uh, which would lessen the value of the dollar. With more than four million members, the Grange would begin to play a very vital role in especially the politics and the economic health of both the South and the West. Remember the West at that point means west of the Mississippi, not west including the Pacific Northwest Coast, although it includes that as well. Okay, so populism, the rise and fall of populism happens and because people are feeling like um, they are, they're feeling powerless and they're beginning to organize and try to fight for the rights of the regular people. So it's a movement of the people. It was born with the founding of the Populist or People's Party in 1892. On July 2nd of 1892, a Populist Party convention was held in Omaha, Nebraska, and it demanded all kinds of reforms to lift the burden of debt from farmers and other types of workers, like industrial workers, and to give the people a greater voice in their own government. The Populist Party platform included economic reforms proposed by um, the populace, which would include an increase in the money supply, so back to that bimetallism idea, which would produce a rise in prices received for goods and services. They also promoted an idea of a graduated income tax. Instead of a flat income tax, they wanted people to pay less if they made less and mediocre if they made medium amount of money and more if they made a lot of money and a federal loan program. The proposed governmental reforms included the election of U.S. Senators by popular vote, which wasn't being done at the time. There was a time in our history where Senators were appointed, and um, by electing our own Senators, it gave people more power, they felt, over the voice in that, in that part of our government. They wanted single terms for the President and the Vice President and a secret ballot to end voter fraud. At this point in history, people are voting and others are watching over how they vote. So for example, you might go to a precinct in New York City and your, um, the, your boss or some sort of representative of your boss would be standing there watching how you voted. They would also tell you how to vote and then monitor how you voted. And so people didn't feel like they were free to vote their own conscience. <clears throat> Finally, the populace also called for an eight-hour workday and restrictions on immigration. The proposed changes were so attractive to struggling farmers and desperate laborers that in 1892, the populist presidential candidate won almost 10% of the total vote. In the West, the People's Party elected five senators, three governors, and about 1,500 state legislators. The populist programs eventually became the platform for the Democratic Party and kept alive the concept that the government is responsible for reforming social injustices and in a just um, much more basic sense that people ought to, the government ought to be the voice of the people. The Panic of 1893. During the 1880s, farmers were overextended with debts and loans already because of all the other issues that we talked about. Railroad construction had expanded far, farther and faster than markets had. And in February of 1893, and in part, sorry to like go back, but in part because the federal government was subsidizing with those huge land grants. So the railroad companies were like, whoa, let's just build as fast as we can to get that federal land grant money. And it didn't matter and sometimes that there was no town that they were headed toward. And so um, these railroads are spending a lot of money and trying to get that free land, assuming that they're going to be able to sell that land to make the money back. And the bottom line is some railroads get in trouble. So anyway, the railroads expanded faster than markets, and in February of 1893, the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad went bankrupt, followed by the Erie and Northern Pacific. 
and the Union Pacific and the Santa Fe, the government's gold supply had worn really thin, partly due to its obligation to purchase silver. People panicked and traded paper money for gold, and the panic spread to Wall Street, where prices of stocks fell really rapidly. The price of silver plunged, causing silver mines to close, and by the end of the year, over 15,000 businesses and 500 banks had collapsed. Investments declined, consumer purchases, wages, and prices also fell. Panic deepened into a depression. Three million people lost their jobs, and by December of 1894, one-fifth of the workforce was unemployed. Now, this is on scale with the Great Depression, and during the Great Depression, in some places, as high as 25 to maybe even 33 percent of the people were unemployed, which means a quarter to maybe a third. So here we're talking about an economic depression that's almost as severe almost as severe. Many farm families especially suffered from both hunger and unemployment. Since the farmers were already in dire straits, this especially hit that community hard. <clears throat> okay, so toward the end here, we're going to talk silver and gold and the guy on the right, his name is William Jennings Bryan. He runs for president four times, four times, and isn't able to pull it off at any point. So William Jennings Bryan on the right, very active in politics, and he's a silverite, meaning he promotes the idea of bimetallism. On the left, you have William McKinley. He is a gold bug. That's the term they use to describe the um, politics, the political <clears throat> representatives that wanted the gold standard only, okay? So the populists would have been supportive of William Jennings Bryan. In the 1896 election, um, this debate goes all the way up to the highest levels of our country. Original members uh, ships of the Grange, our own local Granges, some of them, and some of the things that we do in those local Granges, local meetings, uh, voting when we used to vote in person. So the populist watched as those two major political parties became really deeply divided in a struggle between different regions and economic interests. William McKinley represented the Republican Party, William Jennings Bryan, the, the Democrats. And away we go. Business owners and bankers of the industrialized Northeast tended to be Republican. So business owners and bankers in the Northeast, they had a motivation to keep that money supply worth a lot, right? Bankers had loaned back off that money um, when it was either expensive or cheap. They didn't want to be paid back in cheap money, okay? Farmers and laborers of the agrarian South and West tended to be Democrats, and also the industrialized workers in the Northeast, if they could vote without fear, tended to be Democrats. The central issue of the campaign, which was metal, would be the basis for the nation's monetary system. On one side were the silverites, of course, who favored bimetallism, a monetary system in which the government would have citizens, would give citizens either gold or silver in exchange for paper currency or checks. And on the other side was President Cleveland and eventually William McKinley as gold bucks who favored the gold standard, backing dollars solely with gold, which would have kept the value of money high. The backing of currency was an important campaign issue because people regarded paper money as worthless if it couldn't be turned in for gold or silver. Brian and the Cross of Gold Stepping into the debate, the Populist Party called for bimetallism and the free coinage of silver, yet their strategy was undecided. Should they join forces with sympathetic candidates in the major parties and risk losing their political identity, or should they nominate their own candidate and risk losing the election? As the 1896 campaign progressed, the Republican Party stated its firm commitment to the gold standard and nominated Ohioan William McKinley for president. After much debate, the Democratic Party came out in favor of a combined gold and silver standard, including unlimited coinage of silver. And at the Democratic Convention in Nebraska, William Jennings Bryan, editor of a newspaper there, delivered an impassioned ad address to the assembled parties there, delegates. Bryan won the Democratic nomination. When the populist convention met two weeks later, the delegates were both pleased and frustrated. He lost, however, the election. 
Well, he lost the election. The important message was that people had